this week, um, I think it was probably, you know, the days, they just all merge into one. I think it was only yesterday um, that I laced this and I shared um, the process of lacing this sampler in the Anne Morrison Stitch Along group on Facebook. And um, somebody asked me if I would do a video about um, lacing. So um, I thought that I would talk about um, that um, in this video. Now, um, the board. The board I use is Tawny Conservation Board. Now, Tawny makes all sorts of boards, but the important thing is that it is conservation board. It's acid free. And um, the size of board that I use is determined by the frame that I choose. Now, um, with frames, I like having fillets put in. And um, the reason I like having fillets put in, so this and this is the original, is the frame. This other piece is what I call a fillet. And what happens, the glass I have put in sits between the fillet and the actual frame. See, that is where, not there, but there, that's where the glass is sitting. And that's why I like to have a fillet put in. It naturally lifts the glass away from the needlework. So, I have to choose my frame and the fillet. And then the framer will measure the um, area that sits under that. And for the frame and fillet I have chosen for violet, that measures 1.5 centimetres. And I want to have half a centimetre gap between the edge of the needlework and the fillet. So I know that I had to add two centimetres all the way around the design uh, to get the right size board. So um, I came away uh, from the framers with various different boards for the different models that I have to frame. And I sat down and started working on uh, violet. Now, the temptation with anything we do is to just jump in. But preparation will save you time in the long run. So what I always do, and I, there's never an exception to this, I sit down, I measure two centimetres for this particular one. Sometimes it's two and a half, sometimes it's three centimetres. It could be different to that as well. So I measured two centimetres away and I counted how many threads that was and I stitched out a basin line all the way around. And that basting line will make certain that I get this centred perfectly the first time and that means it's centered on the vertical and the horizontal. You can waste a day just laying your fabric on your board and moving it around trying to get it centered. That basting line will get you centered first time every time. So what I do, I um, on a big one um, I would measure on the board the centre points as well. But this was so small, I didn't actually do it on this one. Um, maybe if it was my first time or I was still a novice, I would have. So what I did then, I placed this over the board using the white side of the board. Um, the brown side is on the back. And then I got pins and I pinned all four corners. Um, where the basting line fell. Once I pinned the four corners, I then took another pin and pinned the centres. So if this was on a bigger one, I would have marked the centre with a pin of my design and I would have pinned that to the little mark I had put on the board. But this one I did by eye because it's so small. So I pinned in the centre points then I pinned in the quarter points 
And after I'd done the quarter points on this one because it was so small, I then just put pins in approximately every centimetre. If this was a bigger piece, I would have gone round and pinned in eighths. And if it was a really big piece, I would have gone around and pinned in sixteenths and maybe even in thirty twos. But that wasn't needed on one of this size. So um, I use a lot of pins, but by pinning uh, so close together, it means that this sampler is evenly stretched. You don't want to have a wibbly wobbly line. You know, you don't. You know, you do not want that. And by pinning it so close together, you are getting the, the tension that your work is put under by stretching it even. Then I turn the work over. And um, this one's a square one. So I'm just going to explain. On Agnes, I would have um, laced her going this way first and then that way secondly. So um, I fold over the work and also um, normally, uh, probably this wasn't the best one to use as an example, um, the piece of linen I stitched violet on was an off cut. Um, but normally I would trim the linen back so it was even all the way around. But because this is very small and I didn't really have much use for a piece of linen that was just this size, I decided just to fold all the linen over. Um, so anyway, I'm digressing now. I start my thread with a tailor's knot and that is a tailor's knot. I don't like using um, knots. I just think it's unsightly and little finishing touches really count on your work and a tailor's knot you might know as something different but basically you take a little stitch and you stitch over it three times giving little tugs so that it locks you might want to go a fourth time as well and then you just snip off the end and away you go now you are going to have one long continuous thread working back and forth but you're not going to start with a massively long thread. You're going to start with a sensible length of thread. If it's too long, all that's going to happen is it's going to twist and tangle and knot. Start with a sensible length and go backwards and forwards. And when you get to the tail end of the thread, you are going to cut another length of thread and join that on with a weaver's knot. Um, I have tried filming me tying a weaver's knot but it's very hard to see but on Google, if you Google a weaver's knot you will find many many diagrams uh, showing how to make the knot and basically this knot locks the two pieces of thread together safely so they don't separate under tension but the knot is tied in such a way that it will still pass through your linen so you can carry on stitching and the knot slides through and then you just keep on adding to your thread uh, so you finish up that you've used one continuous length of thread and then all you do is you finish with um, a tailor's knot again uh, to end and that's really nice and neat. Then you will uh, want to do the other side. What I normally do, the side I've done, I remove the pins. Otherwise, your thread has a habit of wrapping around the, uh, the pins and it can be a little bit of a nuisance. So I would take out the pins for the side I've just laced. And then I would fold my fabric over. I wouldn't mitre it because if you mitre it, it makes it bulky. So I would just fold it over and to keep my fold neat, I will pin that together. So I'm not pinning this to this, I'm just pinning the fold together. And you'll notice by pinning it, I've kept my edges neat. What you don't want is for the fabric to slip a little bit. And then I would just repeat the process, 
take all the pins out and then I would just remove the basting line from around and that's how I stretch and lace a sampler onto a board ready for framing. With your tension, you don't want it so tense that the board bends, um, but you want it to um, be, you know, under a little bit of tension, but not a huge tension. When you get to the end, before you tie off, it's a good idea just to go back through, um, evening up your tension, and I do that with a, a fairly big needle or even a bodkin, and I just I just pull them a little bit, and you always end up with a little bit more thread because you've tightened it up a bit. But the tension will come with your experience of lacing. Um, you can't expect to sit down and do something new and get it right first time. Um, but I hope that my guidelines will help you uh, frame and uh, prepare your sampler ready for framing. If you've done this work, you know your sampler is safe um, for future generations. You hear such horror stories about framers. And of course, you drop something off at a framer, you get it back, you can't see what they've done. Um, so anyway, that's um, how I frame, uh, so why am I saying framing? That's how I stretch and lace a sampler ready for framing. Okay, so I've still got loads of things to talk about. Um, maybe we ought to talk about the new release. Um, so the framers was Tuesday, um, either Wednesday or Thursday, um, we released Emma Lavinia Croker. And Emma is a really pretty sampler. Um, of course, it's the red house that my eye goes straight to. And it's a really lovely Georgian townhouse. Um, beautiful honeysuckle border, lovely peacocks, quite unusual and very sort of elegant sweeping peacocks. Um, I love the colours that Emma used. She chose some beautiful shades of green, those bluey grey greens. Very, very pretty sampler. And her verse is, "'Tis religion that can give sweetest pleasures while we live. Tis religion must supply solid comfort when we die." That's true, actually. Um, and then Emma Lavinia Croker, July the 16th, 1825. And Emma Lavinia Croker, it's such a beautiful name. Um, I was thrilled with this sampler and um, I know that quite a few of you that um, I've spent time stitching with um, the uh, sampler symposium in January at the attic, summer school, um, you know, various get-togethers. You would have seen me stitching on this sampler. This sampler was my travel project for quite some time. Um, this sampler has been all over the place, um, but she was a fun stitch. Um, now, we decided to release Emma as a PDF. And the reason we chose to release her as a PDF was that I wanted Emma to be available to as many people as possible. And um, I wanted her to be available for needleworkers who stitch on Ada as well as linen. So I had to provide uh, not only a true reproduction, but I had to provide an adaptation as well. And um, how we adapted um, Emma was not to rechart the verse over two. We decided that um, it would be nice to offer the full Emma as a reproduction, but a smaller version of Emma as an adaptation. So basically, what we did for the adaptation was we dropped the board, the top of the border down, and we brought down to the bottom, um, these two little um, birds in little bowers, the crowns and this lovely little spray of flowers. So we brought those down 
and um, we um, took away the satin stitch in the chimneys, replacing it with cross stitch over two, and then we recharted Emma's name across the bottom uh, so that it was over two, but there was room to um, have Emma Lavinia Croker, July the 16th, 1825, just as it was on the uh, original sampler. So um, Emma is very much an inclusive sampler. Uh, you can stitch her on Ada Linen uh, or Linada, and you can stitch her with the uh, verse over one, um, or you can stitch the smaller version, um, which is just over two. I'm coming undone here. Um, right, so all of that meant that she needed to be a PDF because she ran to many, many pages. And um, we've offered um, this PDF in two different formats. Um, you can buy the adaptation just by itself at a lower cost, or for three pounds more, you can uh, purchase the PDF, which gives you the reproduction and the adaptation as a little bonus. Um, the PDF, uh, whichever version you buy, comes with um, Emma's story. And we do know quite a bit about Emma uh, from her birth to her death. And uh, we write about her life, her family, and um, the time that she lived in. So you get two and a half pages of the story about Emma. You get a stitch guide. And um, then you get a thread legend for the reproduction and the adaptation. There are 18 colours in the reproduction and 17 colours in the adaptation. Now, I stitched this model with um, Overa Soir Dalche. Um, I started her before I really um, discovered the beauty of 103. So, um, with the thread legend, you get the Soir Dalche, the Soir 103, and the DMC. But what we've done with Emma, because we um, now have such a following of Aid as stitchers and stitchers who like to work on the lower counts, we have given you the thread quantities in a different way. We have given you um, thread quantities that are specific to 103 using one strand on 46 count and Soir d'Alger using one strand on 46 count. But we then go on to give you Soir d'Alger one strand on 36 count, DMC um, two strands on 36 count, and then two strands of Soir d'Alger on 28 count, and two strands of DMC on 28 count. 103 comes on spools of 50 metres. DMC when you uh, ply the uh, strand uh, is 48 metres and Soir d'Alger is 35 metres. So the spools and the skeins all give you different meterage. And I think um, that sort of, again, makes our um, designs um, inclusive uh, and tries to cater for as many different stitches as possible. Uh, the, uh, th the design area on the reproduction is 293 stitches by 355. The adaptation is the same width, so it's still 293, but the height is 217. Um, now, with the um, adaptation, there is a 15-page colour chart a 15 page black and white chart and then a one page colour and a one page black and white that is designed to be uh, stitched from your electronic device whether that's a phone, tablet, laptop, PC or even a TV screen. 
the reproduction uh, is 20 page uh, colour, 20 page black and white and the one page version in colour and black and white as well. So um, if you uh, go for the reproduction version which gives you the adaptation there's over 80 pages so when you download it save it and then select what you would like to print um, because you know it's chunky. Um, I hope that um, you like um, all the options that we've given you with Emma. Um, many of you have already purchased her and the interesting thing is that about 99% of the purchases has been for the um, the reproduction with the bonus adaptation uh, in as well. So I'm going to be very interested to see um, how many people are going to stitch the adaptation and how many people are going to stitch the reproduction. But please share um, your stitching with us. We love seeing our designs being stitched. Um, Emma is available on our website and remember there are two versions so uh, choose the version that you want carefully. A few people bought both versions and I've refunded them the, uh, the adaptation because I don't think um, that they realise that you actually got the adaptation as a bonus with the reproduction. But you know if that mistake happens I'm always very happy to um, sort that out for you. Um, Emma is also available for the stores that uh, work with us with our PDF downloads as well. Um, so uh, enjoy her. I hope she brings as much pleasure to you as she brought to me. Um, okay, so um, before I get to the giveaway, let's have a chat about my um, additions to Stash. Well, I bought... Um, another project pouch this week um, and um, this is adorable I love 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 the colours and again this is from Patchwork Paw Print I really like Val's project bags um, the other company that make really fabulous project bags are Oso oh Twinkle Crafts but I think that she's overwhelmed with orders because her Etsy store is actually closed at the moment um, but anyway, there are loads of beautiful project bags on um, Patchwork Paw Print, Val's Etsy site, and um, I just love it. I love the way these project bags are finished. They are done to such a high standard. You know, all the corners are beautifully mitered. The zip is put in so beautifully. And um, everything is just finished so neatly inside. I think that's so important and um, these project bags, Val does them in various different sizes. I think this is the larger one um, so that um, you know you can fit your our booklets in because they are English uh, size A4 um, and you know you've got room for your hoop and your threads. Um, this is perfect for me. So that was another project bag. My husband says, why do you need another one? Because I do, because I like them. <laughs> and then the other delivery I had was from the attic. Beautiful, beautiful linens, gorgeous linens. Now I must be careful to keep these right. These are all 5260. They're all lakeside linen and the colors are beautiful. This is, um, Vintage butter cream, really beautiful. Love that. Um, love, love, love. Uh, I should have opened these up before, but I do want to be careful to keep them right. Um, this is vintage meadow rue, and these um, these are really, really lovely dye lots on this batch. Um, this one is yeah, vintage exemplar. A big cloud has come um, over, the, over the sun outside. And this room is darkened because of it. And vintage fawn. That's a lovely colour. They're all lovely colours. So that was um, a really lovely bonus this week to have four. Um, 
halves of 5260 from Lakeside. These are very precious and will be used very, very carefully. I've got another delivery of linen that's in the post um, coming from um, Exude Designs and um, I'll show you those as soon as they arrive. Um, I, I hope this week actually. Ducas always sells, uh, sends her linen uh, trapped and I don't think they're far away from arriving. Now, I received a present this week from a friend in America. Um, they bought this book for themselves and they thought that I would enjoy it as well, so they got it for me. And it's American Samplers by Ethel Stanwood Bolton and Eva Johnson Co. And I've had a quick, this only arrived yesterday, so I've had a quick uh, look through and there is just so, so much in this book but I haven't had a chance to read it other than um, the introduction and it says um, the raison d'etre of the sampler is most practical needlework and embroidery were the primary form of relaxation for most 17th century women and almost everything was embroidered a 17th century book called needles Excelsi, well, that's a funny word, Excelsi, Excellency, Excellency, gives a list of things for which a sampler was required, including handkerchiefs, tablecloths, sheets, towels, napkins and pillowcases. Since there were few, if any, books of patterns, the sampler was a pattern book and contained the designs and stitches which appealed to the creator's tastes. Considering samplers to be the primary basis and training school of American needlework in the early days of the nation, this book is based on over 2,500 descriptions of samplers, nearly 400 pictures of samplers, and examination of over 300 actual samplers from the 17th and 18th centuries. In choosing the illustrations, only those have been only those have been chosen which exhibit American types or are interesting historically and represent most of the various stitches and model patterns used in such needlework. While many American samplers contain only the alphabet and numerals with added moral mottos, yet others display such sense of artistic feeling and tasteful ornamentation as merit attention. Registers of 17th, 18th and early 19th century samplers, an anthology of sampler verse from 1610 to 1830, a list of early schools and schoolmistresses and a section on embroidered heldry with register of embroidered arms makes this an invaluable chronological history of the American sampler. It does sound really interesting. So uh, it's not in colour, but I'm sure there is a lot of um, information to be learned. And I have to say that my knowledge of American samplers is almost zero. And I think this is my friend's uh, way of saying, Nicola, you need to start learning more about American samplers. Um, so that was one book that arrived, and thank you very much to my friend. It was very kind of her. The other book that arrived um, is New Zealand's Historic Samplers by um, Vivian Cowley. And this is a really beautiful book. And before I get too far into it, I want to show you that the cover comes with a chart for an Australian um, sampler and then you've got your stitch ledge oh that's upside down you've got your stitch ledge there I always think it's nice when you get a bonus we all like a little gift and a free gift um, and this book um, it was brought to my attention because of Heather um, and um, the sampler that's very much like um, a Heather Jardine sampler. Can you see these parrots? Okay, well those parrots are identical 
to the sampler stitch by Mary Bordas. And there's the parrot. And she stitched this sampler in 1822 and Heather stitched, sorry, 1922. And Heather stitched her sampler in 1933. But you can see those parrots are the same. And um, when this book was brought to my attention, I thought, well, this is a must. Um, you know, because I want to learn more about samplers from around the world. Uh, so um, it's a really um, interesting book, very well written, some lovely um, photographs and, you know, stories behind the samplers. I love the stories behind the samplers. Um, I bought this from Abe Books. Um, and it, it wasn't um, too, ex I can't remember the exact price, but it was affordable. Um, the shipping um, from New Zealand is not cheap, but A Books, um, you know, it all worked out very well. I can't remember the price, so I should have got that for this video, and I apologise. So, New Zealand's historic samplers are Stitch Stories by Vivian Cowley. A delightful book, and I'm very, very pleased um, to have this on my bookshelf. And one of the really touching things about, um, or the touching words in this book about samplers, and these are words that I use an awful lot when I talk about samplers, is that a sampler may be the only words of a woman that survive. Samplers are very, very precious. Um, okay, I'm nearly getting to the end. Um, I had a question. Uh, I, I get lots of questions every week, but I thought this was a really uh, interesting question. Hello, I'm from New Mexico. My question is, when you're stitching on a motif that is continued on another page, is it best to stitch page by page or jump to the continuing page? Um, and it then goes on with some um, personal things. And... Um, we all are different. Some of us like stitching page by page and others like stitching an entire motif. Personally, I like stitching an entire motif. And I have now for a long, long time, I've been stitching off my phone. I have my frame with my linen and I have my phone there and I blow up and move around the design as I'm stitching. So I like to stitch an entire motif. About two months ago, a needle worker wrote to me about um, a problem that she had. And what she had done, she had stitched a very, very um, large motif. Um, by a page and this motif actually was a big grass uh, swathe, uh, a, a big grass bank in front of a house and what had happened, she'd stitched the one page, she then went on to stitch the next page and when she looked she had a line in that bank, a vertical line where she had stopped and worked back and forwards, and then worked back and forwards the other way. There was a definite line. Um, for me, it works better stitching an entire motif, but there's never a right and wrong way. It's always what works for you. So experiment. You know, this needlework journey, we learn through trial and error what is best for us. Okay, now the giveaway. I saw something the other week that I absolutely adored and I thought, right, I'm getting one of those for me and I'm going to get one of those for another needle worker as well. And um, what I bought was this little comes in a beautiful box. This little stitching station. Okay, so there's a little pin cushion. It comes with 
a set of really sweet little scissors and they have a nice little cut on them, these scissors. And it comes with um, a thimble. This thimble, I don't think it's meant to be used. It's far too big for my fingers and I have quite big hands. But it is absolutely adorable. Um, and why I loved it, I think, so much, because they had different versions of this, um, was this little teddy bear and he had a red bow. And I couldn't believe that because I had stitched my teddy bear on Heather's sampler with a red dicky bow. So I thought, I have to have this. Um, and it came and it is adorable. Even on the thimble, there are little teddy bears just absolutely adorable and this is made by um, A.E. Williams and they are, I'm going to put my glasses on, no good without my glasses, um, they are manufacturers of some of the finest pewter wear in the world, that's what it says on the box. Um, so this um, is mine I have another version of this all packed up in a box ready for somebody to win. And all you have to do to enter into the giveaway for one of these is comment on this video. A comment on Instagram, a comment on Facebook or by email or anything else will not count. Your comment has to be on this video. I have to have things in one place. And what you have to comment is, what name are you going to give this teddy bear? But the teddy bear is a male teddy bear. So I want a name for a male teddy bear. Um, I am going to ask a friend, uh, a non-needleworking friend, a real life friend, uh, to go through the comments and pick the name that she likes the best and I will announce who has won a version of this not next weekend but the weekend after in my video. So to win a little stitching station like this you have to comment on this video and give me a male name for this sweet little teddy bear. I hope that you enjoy. Um, and actually, do you know what? That's really good timing because a delivery man has just pulled up outside my house. I don't know if you heard the van go past. I wonder if it's my linen that's coming from Ducas. You never know. Um, I think that is everything that I wanted to talk about this week. Um, gosh, it was a lot. <laughs> anyway, um, Next weekend, we have got two printed booklets releasing and um, we're excited about those samplers. So um, tune in next weekend for two more releases. Um, until the next time, stay safe, stay well and bye-bye.